It's time for the match preview, and today we're going to be discussing Coventry versus Luton Town. And Luton head to the CBS Arena, and another person who's heading to the CBS Arena is my co-host Mark Ryman. How are you getting on, Mark? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Despite Wednesday night, I, I'm feeling really positive about Saturday. Um, it's a regular trip to me. It's not too far down the road. Um, despite me having to remortgage the house, sell the car in order to just get for a parking, for parking. Mate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm having to walk. Um, it's gonna, I'm going to leave straight after this. Um, but yeah, despite all of those things, it's um, it's been a it's been a, a relatively happy hunting ground for us as Luton fans. Um, we very rarely lose there, um, and we've had the odd good result as well. So, yeah, looking forward to it. Weren't you lauding on Twitter your free parking that you booked, and then, and then oh, it turned out it was an I, error? I, I, yeah, <laughs> lord, lord, lording's a different word for it. I, I did say at the time, I've either parked in Leicester or it's a glitch, and yeah, I got an email the next day to say, we've accidentally let you park for nothing. Um, please pay us a £1,000 now or we'll cancel your parking, <laughs> something like that. Unbelievable, it really is. For, for a ground that is miles out the way of most places, it is incredibly difficult to park. Um, and uh, I mean, it, it's there's different games it's been, been harder for. We actually, after the playoff final uh, win, um, my wife and I went to go and see Arctic Monkeys there. I think it was only about a month afterwards. I was tempted to wear my Luton shirt, but wasn't allowed. Um, and the, if we think the parking for the football's bad, that was utterly insane, um, the amount of money paid for, for that. But anyway, enough moaning about transport. That's, that's not why we're here, is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. Um, these stadia, like way out of, in the middle yeah. of nowhere. That, that's what makes me look so forward to Power Court because it's just going to be easy to get to. And yeah. public transport right there. Before we look ahead to Coventry, let's have a little, you know, recap of what happened against Sunderland. So I feel it was a very good performance from Luton and it looks like the corner has been turned, personally. Like, that's not diminishing Sunderland, like, contrary to what I said in my immediate post-match reaction. But that's the thing about immediate post-match reactions. I record them as soon as I get home. And it is a case of, you know, my heart's on my sleeve. Um, I do think Sunderland defended really well. But at the same time, I the point I made was this loosen our back, essentially. Yes, it was a loss, but the manner of the loss. I will take a performance like that and a loss over that win against Sheffield Wednesday. Oh, 100%. I agree with most of what you said. And I think there were plenty of Sunderland fans that did. Um, some clearly still angry that they'd bought tickets for hotels in Wembley and, and didn't get to, to use them last time because, you know, we, we played physical against them because we knew that it would work. I mentioned it in the pre-match. If we play physical, play in a physical way, um, I think we'll do OK. And, and we did. Um, I think as well, though, it's worth saying that it, it wasn't one dimensional football. Yes, there was a lot of long balls, but actually when we we're in their third, we played some really nice football. Clark's ball out to Moses on the wing and that cross back in as an example it was great. Even at the end when we were desperate for goals, the little flick on from Brown, the quality control that led to the Alfie Doughty chance. You know, there was some really good football in there as well. And we got through a defence that had, you know, kept most teams out on quite a few occasions. And, you know, if you take the disallowed goal, the penalty shouts and a couple of really good chances, let's be fair, Clark and, and Doughty's especially, then then really, you know, we should have got something from that game. Um, I agree with you. We were brilliant. I think we were absolutely excellent considering um, that the amount of energy that Watford took out of us and the amount of players that had had clearly not really trained, I think, for the vast majority of them, they should be really, really proud of themselves. And and that was, you know, they, they got a, a massive ovation at the end of the game, and rightly so as well. Rob Edwards absolutely got everything bang on. And we were undone by two moments of quality. I'll tell you what it reminded me of a bit, the uh, Burnley game at home last season in the Prem. Slightly different, but... You've got actually Eli's first goal, right, in the Premier League as well. So um, weird, weird sort of parallel there. 
we just get ourselves back into the game and then sucker punched a few minutes later with an absolute um, smasher of a goal. Uh, um, Mundell's goal was excellent. Clark should have done better, but it was still an excellent finish. Um, two moments of quality and they'll do well this season, Sunderland, with players that can finish like that under pressure. So fair play to them in those those quality moments. And as an away performance, you'll come away from that pleased. Um, but yeah, as a Luton fan, I'm I'm more than happy with that. We'll we'll win more games than than we lose playing playing like that at home. That's for sure. Yeah, one hundred percent agree. It's about keeping that intensity, that fight and desire, moving into this game, and it's an interesting one as well because some of the standouts were actually in the back line, other than being undone by those two pieces of magic. You know, Tom Holmes, Mark McGuinness, even Daiki Hashioka. Yeah, um, I didn't expect to a good performance from him. I'm not saying it was a 10 out of 10, but it was a 7 out of 10. You know, he wins his aerial battles. He's defensively relatively astute, considering he's playing out of position. And it, it'd be good to uh, discuss some of the team news now going into the Coventry game, because obviously defensive-wise... We are down to bare bones, as shown from the Sunderland game. So going into this game, it looks like Amari, too soon for Amari Bell. Don't know about Mads. Um, Rua Waters, he's obviously out for, you know, two to three months with a broken foot. It's an interesting one. I heard on the LTST pod that he'd been playing with it for like a month or so. And then it was only when he went on international duty to England that they picked it up. How did we miss a broken foot? Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a worry, isn't it? Um, I guess it depends where the break is. I mean, I am not a doctor, um, if that wasn't clear enough already, but there are, there are some, some bones within the foot that, that are probably harder to slightly pick up can feel like strains maybe it's that I don't know give us the benefit of the doubt but you know he clearly struggled against Sheffield United but we mm. all put that down to him playing on the wrong side against Ratsaki maybe it was also because of that because he was clearly playing with it then if not before as you say um, so yeah it's a real shame because I think he started the season particularly really really well um, he's clearly got some promise um, so it's a bit of a shame to lose him for that length of time but most of the other injuries, at least a short term, we don't know about Burke, do we? No, uh, I guess th this is recorded prior to the um, Rob's uh, press conference. There's Ted and Mengi as well. So, you know, we are literally down to bare bones when it comes to um, defence. I think uh, Liam Walsh is going to be back for this one, though. Be interesting to see where he fits in. And Marvellous Nakamba, who didn't get a minute against Sunderland. It'll be interesting to see if maybe he starts because his minutes are being managed on his return from injury. Yeah, you, you'd think that Marv will probably play a bit more of a role being away from home as well. I guess he didn't come on because of the nature of where we were in the game. We were chasing the game, weren't we? So it was more about getting the attacking players on the pitch. Walsh will be a good option. Um, Shandon Baptiste might be fit as well I'm not sure but it looks like he's close if he's not fit already so we'll have a lot of midfielders to choose from just not many defenders maybe some of them can play centre back Mate, not Walsh not Walsh I, no, yeah, well, he likes to tackle <laughs> doesn't he I completely yeah. forgot about Shandon Baptiste that is crazy Like until you mention him right now completely slipped my mind um I guess that comes with the territory of signing injury prone players, isn't it? Like they they are gonna get injuries. Um well though Mads Anderson didn't have that injury record. <laughs> Mads Anderson. Mads yeah. Anderson's allergic to coming on the pitch for Luton. He just strains <laughs> just looking at it, just sitting on the subs bench. Um, bless him. I do really feel for him. I, I really do. Shandon Baptiste's an interesting one because it was his shoulder, I think, that we kept getting dislocated for, for Brentford, but he's had other areas now but he is a hell of a player to to come back in I really rate him and he's got quality in that cross and now we've got both Eli and Morris in the goals oh someone someone else apart from Doughty that can get the ball in the box that's going to be absolutely lethal if we have a look at the previous encounters between 
Luton and Coventry. It's an interesting one. So going mm. back with FOTMOB, so they have the last 11. And if you want to see every single encounter since the, the formation of both football clubs, you can actually go to Hatters Heritage and select Coventry in the matches. And it'll show you every single game, every single Luton lineup against Coventry for every single year since we've been playing them. But for the benefit of, you know, a match preview that d- we don't want this to be an hour and a half long. We're just going to have a look at the last 11 games. Um, the last of which, which was interesting. So the last 11 games, Luton have won four. There have been six draws and one win. And interestingly, Coventry have come up through the divisions with us. Mm. So these games, they go back to League Two, League One, a lot of you know head-to-heads in the championship as well. Are there any previous games that sort of take your fancy, uh, with the exception of the playoff final? Yeah. Any that well, stick obviously. in your minds? I, I mean, there's the five nil, the five nil. Um, yeah. I, I think that was again. My memory is not what it was. Um, I think that was the game after we were three nil up against Swansea and drew three three. Yeah, and it was. I, re- we were, I remember we were terrible. Being... Yeah, I remember being 3 0 up against Coventry and going, It's not enough. It's not enough. We're going to lose. That's <laughs> like, funny. And we know, I think we scored four just for, maybe we're 4 0 up at half time. It was, it was three or four up at half time. Anyway, yeah, I mean, that obviously sticks in my mind. Coventry did one on us as well and beat us 3 0 um, when we were both pushing for promotion out of League One, I think it was. Um, so that that for the wrong reason. I don't know whether this counts as the last 11, um, but I went to Luton Town versus Coventry in the Cup when Coventry were in the top flight. I think they're in the top flight at the end of the 90s. and we beat. Them no, that's uh, this only goes back to 2017 on FOTMOB, but you know what? Oh, right. you check that out on Hatter's Heritage. Have You'll be able to read the programme. So, yeah, sorry for going off piece lightly. Just uh, I remember that game very, very vividly. Um, that my dad taking me to the football and, and thinking there's no way we can get a result against them. And, and now looking at us on, on even par, it's interesting for those of us of, of our age, thinking of Coventry, we think of them as a really top side, don't we? And, and you know, um, it's interesting how, how time changes things and where we are now in comparison to them. But yeah, I suppose recently, definitely that 5 nil has obviously got to be up there, right? Yeah, so we were actually four up at half time, you're right, because Elijah Adebayo scored in the sixth mm. minute of added time. And that was, I think, probably the peak for Nathan Jones, uh, even more so than making it to the playoffs that season. Because after, you know, chucking away a three goal lead against Swansea, then we turn out that performance. And under Nathan Jones, there was never like two bad performances on the trot. It was mm. always, there was always a reaction. Um, a game that sticks in my mind, I think it was 2-2 or 1-1 in the championship. Um, and I remember a great ball from, I think it was 1-1. Mm. Uh, no, 2-2. And I just remember from it, um, Victor Jokerez scored that goal where he completely roasted Dan Potts for pace. It's it's crazy to think that in the yeah. playoff final, Reese Burke came on and did a job on Victor Jokerez because his numbers now in Portugal are oh, insane. One amazing player, speed, finish, everything. Yes, I know the game you're talking about. It was 2-2. Yeah. Uh, we, I think we'd scored early doors and then Sheaf sent that long ball. And I, I, what I remember, it's the reason why I remember this game, is Potts had like a 30-yard head start on Jokerez and you just see Jokerez turn it on and zoom! <laughs> straight past Potts yeah. and finish uh, past um, was it James Shane goal? Was it, it might have Horvath? been Horvath? Uh, twenty two, twenty three. No, I think it was Horvath. It was Horvath then, yeah. yeah. And I think he did the same to Gabe Osho, didn't he? Um, at their place as well. I think. That oh was yeah, Gabe gave away a penalty. Was it penalty? He gave away. We were one. It up. was a penalty. Yeah, he got in behind Gabe and pulled yeah. him down. Yeah, that's right. What a player! Like, yeah. I'm happy we're not going up yeah, against I was him. Say. Tomorrow. Yeah, thank goodness for that. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? There are quite a few threats in the Coventry side. 
Like, yes, um, there are threats. Y- you have your... Because, you know, Gustavo Haim is gone, but Ben Sheaf has stepped into that role. And you don't have Victor Jokerez now, but you have Haji Wright, Ella Sims. Like, yes, they're not as good as Victor Jokerez, but they, they've taken the money that they've accrued from those players and they've filled their squad with really good players. And that that's the thing. I don't understand the the position they're in now. I just I don't understand what's gone wrong. I I, I asked a Cobb fan about it, and he said we're just making errors. So it sounds mm. familiar, right? Yeah, it does. I mean, it sounds like a, a you talked about us being on parallels with Coventry, <laughs> even in terms of performances at the start of the season. Very good squad, underperforming. I I, I think that. They, they've had less change than us, and obviously they've had Mark Robbins since their League Two days as well. They did very well last season, and if it wasn't for the FA Cup run, you'd probably argue they'd be in the playoffs. Um, in terms of that, that sort of uh, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but just removing you know some of the focus on the league. But yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, players like Hadji Wright are absolute class, and you know, not showed it as often. Ben Sheaf in the middle, obviously missed the first half of this. Uh, the few games we've had this season, hasn't he? And he's back in now, um, uh, pulling the strings there. Um, and Brandon Thomas Sante from West Brom is a good player to come mm. on as well with pace and he can finish as well. So, oh yeah, they've got plenty of threats. There's no underestimation of them fr- from us. I'm sure not anyone who's seen any of our pods, you know, we've done nothing but Lord praise on, on Coventry and Mark Robbins. So, you know, we know what a threat they're going to be. Um, despite their results, and we just got to hope that they continue to have an off game against us. Yeah, and just looking through their squad as well, the options they have in defence. I think Jake Bidwell will be missing out. He's be, he's one that's been mm-hmm. with them for a long time. But Liam Kitching, you know, when we were looking to raid Barnsley, personally, again, I would have gone for Liam Kitching over Mads Anderson personally. That that's just my thoughts on it. But they have great players. Jada Silva, who was in the Luton Academy, he's one that I would have loved to have got back at any time, you know, especially as he was a free agent. Bobby Thomas, really highly rated. And they just have quality throughout their team. Jack Rodoni, one that we were linked to a lot. And I don't understand this position they're in. Like, and you mentioned mm. Brandon Thomas Asante. I mentioned Ellis Sims and Haji Wright. And then they've also got Sakamoto, who's a wonderfully te- technical yeah. player as well. Yeah. It's it's absolutely crazy. And it has been a case of Mark Robbins turning it around, you know, for, uh, well, changing it around 4 2 3 1, 4 3 3, 4 5 1. And last game, they're 1 1 against QPR. It looks like they've gone back to basics with a 3 5 2, you know, with Brandon Thomas Asante and Haji Wright up top mm. together and then packing the midfield. Yeah, a bit like us, really, for the last two games, gone back to the a three five two and going back to basics. As a result of that, I mean, they did get a draw against QPR after taking the lead. You'd probably argue that they'd be disappointed, um, but maybe it's something that that they can build on. Um, home form's not been great or as good as it it has been in the past for them too. So, you know, I think it's probably a bit like with us when the pressure was really starting to mount, and it's a tough. It's tough, <clears throat> and I think that there is a there is an expectation as well from from everybody, um, you know, owners all the way down to the fans that they should be pushing towards playoffs at least. Um, I think most most neutrals podcasts whatever had Coventry up there, some really high up there. I think both of us put them in the, in the playoffs, um, and. And that comes with the pressure, as we know, at Luton as well. So, you know, they've clearly got the players, as you say. They've clearly got a manager that knows how how to get the best out of those players too. I think they did some good business. They didn't do loads over the summer, but I think they did some good business. Um, and they've built a, a really good squad while not, you know, you know, apart from the two obvious ones, a bit like our two obvious ones that we lost, that's going to have a big impact. Um, they didn't lose a huge amount of players. So, yeah, it is a surprise that they are where they are. Um, I, I can't see it continuing forever. I really can't. Well, talking about it continuing forever, let's talk about our score predictions for the game. 
So I've backed Luton for a 2-0 away win, mainly because we have turned the corner. I just hope that it's not a case of Luton come to town and this is what Coventry need to kickstart their season, Mm. because I hate it when that happens. Yeah, it seems to happen to us a lot as well. We're really good at getting teams out of their funk and into their <laughs> stride. Preston, North End springs to mind. Um, you know, and obviously it's what Watford did for us. Thanks, Watford. Um, so I think, yeah, I've gone for 3-1 on, on us more than them. I, I really do think that, that Luton have showed it. My, my main fear is that, you know, that both of our best games that have been at home. Can we translate it away from home? I think we were, we have been a good away side um, for the last few seasons. We were certainly a fantastic away side the last time we got promoted from this division. Um, and it's really important that we do the same. Despite us conceding two goals on Wednesday night, I thought we defended really, really well for the last two games. I think our defence, despite, again, we, we talked about players being out, I think our defence has been really good. They're going to be tested. Um, but I think with with our defence, as is, and obviously our keeper, um, Kaminsky for me, is up there as one of the best kit shot stoppers in the league. I think we stand a good chance of keeping them to a minimum. Um, and it's whether or not we can we can make the most of the other end. I think Morris and Eli now will be will be on it, and Eli likes scoring against Coventry. So, fingers crossed, he gets at least another one on Saturday. He does indeed, as does Jordan Clark and Eli. <laughs> Eli yeah. does love playing against Cov. But I, I, look, I guess we'll see what happens. I'm I'm actually quite optimistic about it. I wasn't expecting too much out of the Sunderland game, as as we were discussing in the mm. recap um because you know Sunderland top of the league for a reason and they they are a good team but right now Coventry being in bad form this is like a great time to go to them as we turn the corner um but that's us done for this week and I'd love it if you could let us know your thoughts and predictions ahead of this Coventry match in the comments below uh get involved And also, if you're watching this video and you're not subscribed to our channel, subscribe. Join in the fun. We have tons of Luton Town and Championship content over here on our channel. And whoever you support, well, you're you're probably watching this, so you're a Luton Town fan. Have a great week. And most importantly, come on, you hatters.